It's Tuesday, February 27th. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Football Show. It is a hell of a day to talk ball. And joining me to do just that is JJ Zacharyson, my good pal, JJ. What's going on, buddy? What's up, man? You know, I was uh, I was telling you right before we started, I'm, I'm coming off of the flu a little bit. So th- I wouldn't say this is like my flu podcast, like I'm past that sure. point. Uh, but, you know, if there's a little brain fog going on, if I sound stupid to listeners, that's my excuse. Well, this is the time to sound stupid. Like I was saying to you before <laughs> the show, this is this is February, man. Um, you know, our, our takes are not written in anything more than like a rough draft yeah. i think at this point but it is a pretty big week uh initially we actually were going to have charles mcdonald uh join for this show but jj and i were just talking about this we've been basically texting about these prospects so much and communicating behind the scenes like you know what let's just me and you do a show here uh at, uh, at the dawn of the combine basically because I don't know about you. Uh, I know that I definitely feel this way, and I feel like a lot of the listeners are in this boat where we're just like trying to catch up on where we feel about these draft prospects and some of these guys. Like I said, I'm I'm still formulating my opinion on um, shoot all the other positions. That's for sure. But even some of these wide receivers, I'm yeah. still kind of formulating opinions. So I thought the way you d- do things and the way you analyze prospects would be kind of like a great hey, let's get up to speed on these guys. So uh, I'm hyped to do this today. Yeah, man, I'm pumped. I'm pumped. It's a great, great wide receiver class, too. So that's cool. Absolutely. All right. So before we get into the prospect talk, we do have two pieces of news to catch up on since last we spoke to the listeners here, starting with first NFL Network's Ian Rappaport reported that the Bengals informed T Higgins that they were going to franchise tag him on Friday. And then the tag was officially applied first thing Monday morning. Uh, JJ, this one, not surprising to me, but I'm just kind of curious your expectations for this T Higgins. I don't know. I don't want to call it saga, but the T T Higgins situation, does he end up staying in Cincinnati? Is he a tag and trade candidate? Where are you at with this? Doesn't it seem like these situations usually just end up with the player staying with his team? Yeah. Like, 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 like 95% of the time it ends up being that that ends up being the case. The other thing that I think that people need to remember, because we always get hyped whenever they are like big wide receiver, free agents and such. Usually we don't see big wide receiver free agents actually become free agents and hit the market because teams want to retain them. And the guys who do end up hitting the market, I'd say, I mean, one of the best ones that we've seen over the last handful of years is like Christian Kirk, probably, you know, like mm-hmm. it, it, it's like Kenny Galladay was a big one a handful of years ago. And we saw how that turned out. It's because oh boy. When, when teams want to actively not sign and re-sign one of their quote elite pass catchers. Uh, that when, when they don't want to sign them, that's not a good sign that that player is as elite as we thought that he was, right? Uh, you know, like Diggs and AJ Brown both were traded. It was not a, a situation where they were free agents and they switched teams as a result of that. Um, and I think that that you know, with with T Higgins, um, I think if you if you look at what he's done, especially last year, last year and a half or so, he's kind of been inconsistent at times. Hasn't been able to stay fully healthy either. I don't think this is really a bad thing for T either to kind of have a year more, one more year, maybe get a long-term deal, who knows, but get one more year at least with Cincinnati, play alongside Jamar Chase, get a little bit softer coverage, and then kind of go on from there. Because I I still think we're in this space where is T Higgins a true alpha? Is he a true one in the league? I don't know if we have that answer yet. So I think that last point that you, you said there is really instructive because I would have said that T. Higgins is not like you mentioned that these guys usually don't change teams. We have definitely seen like big time elite wide receivers change teams recently, whether it's A.J. Brown, whether it's sure. Tyree Kill, um, even like Marquise Brown got traded recently. Now, I think he is clearly the fourth best of all of these players we've talked about here. Um, but that's usually how B- D.J. Moore, he just got traded with right. basically what what the league told you or the Bears told you they valued DJ Moore as was a first round pick in that number one overall pick trade. I think that T Higgins like is not AJ Brown and like he's not Tyree Kill, but he's kind of in that. I, I, if I was sitting down and ranking wide receivers today, like real life NFL wide receiver rankings, I think I'd put T Higgins somewhere around wide receiver 20. And I think I'd put him behind a guy like DJ Moore. Yeah. So and I think that's that's the place where I'm at with him. And I don't know how much this matters, JJ, because he was dealing with so many injuries last year. But I would say with conviction that last year was his worst NFL season. Right. Uh, in reception perception, 
His worst success rate versus man coverage since his rookie year was last year. Uh, lowest success rate versus press. Lowest success rate versus zone. And again, a lot of this stuff is injuries, but it would be one thing to have this conversation of like, oh yeah, T. Higgins, no doubt about it. He could be a number one receiver for a bunch of other teams. Right. And he probably, I mean, he could be like a number one receiver for the Panthers. Sure. But like, that, what is that really saying? But we're talking about him as like kind of that true alpha type. I, I'm with you that this year makes it even more complicated to kind of go out on that limb because we haven't seen the proof of concept, mm -hmm. A, and then B, if he was coming off a big year, I think it'd be more of a slam dunk. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally with you. Now, will a team go out and try to trade for him post-franchise tag? I mean, that, that's always a possibility. Uh, but I, I just think that we've seen this story play out. And we also have to keep in mind that Cincinnati is a team that is ready to win right now. I mean, they, they, they didn't make the playoffs this past year, obviously, because of Joe Burrow. But they're a team that's ready to to win now. And you don't necessarily like as much as we're saying T Higgins isn't necessarily a number one, a true, true alpha in the league. He's still a very, very, very good asset. I mean, we're talking, you know, top ish 20 wide receivers. So uh, I, I would say that that he's more than likely I'm, I'm putting my my eggs in the Cincinnati basket here. Yeah, me too. Uh, Paul Diener Jr. does a great job covering the Bengals for the Athletic. He wrote a whole like piece about this, and basically, I think that putting the tag on T. Higgins early does signal, like, because you know they have till like what March fifth is the is the yeah. franchise tag deadline. Like, they have a long time to really, if they were going to work out a long term extension, this feels like to me they are saying, hey, ahead of the combine when all these GMs are going to be liquored up at the bar and like talking to each other, like maybe we can work out a trade right. partnership here. But the real thing also is just like, we're putting this on him because we are not going to reach a long-term agreement. Yeah. You can come blow us away with the trade, but also we expect him to just play out the tag And which I, I'm right. with you that if you're T Higgins and certainly if you had T Higgins and dynasty or fantasy or whatever, that's probably the best situation yeah. for him because I think anything else is like more of a hypothetical. Yeah. hundred percent. All right, let's move on to just the next one here. And and we don't have to have a long conversation about this, but ESPN's Adam Schefter reported that all the big-name running backs are not going to be franchise tagged this year. Josh Jacobs, Derrick Henry, Saquon Barkley, Tony Pollard, Austin Eckler. A um, lot of big names there. How much do these guys have left? I'm not really sure. Uh, JJ, varying degrees uh, for a lot of these guys. I, I We've certainly, I think, seen the best of some of these players. Uh, you know, they're, they're past their prime, whatever, but some of these guys, I think, are still pretty good. Like Josh Jacobs, I think, could still have some good years left. Saquon Barkley, I think, could still have some good years left. Derrick Henry in the right situation um, could be uh, could be a monster, I think, still in fantasy. Um, I'm just curious your thoughts just kind of on this, this running back crop here. Uh, anyone stand out to you as particularly interesting on the open market? Any landing spots you're looking at for running backs? Where, where are we at here? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think Saquon is still kind of interesting just because uh, he was a generational talent. I know that we throw that word around a lot, but it's actually true with Saquon Barkley. Uh, we saw we, we've we've seen the insanity of his game, you know, throughout his career so far. Um, and, and really, because of injury, he hasn't really taken that many hits, hasn't carried that much of a, that massive of a workload so far in his career. So I am intrigued by Barkley, uh, you know, within that list. Josh Jacobs, I don't think has necessarily seen this giant decline or anything. So obviously mm -hmm. he can still be an elite talent. Definitely worried a little bit about about Eckler and what happened last year. Definitely worried about what happened with Tony Pollard last year. Uh, you know, even if you say and I can sit here and talk about how Tony Pollard really, really underperformed in the touchdown column last year, which was one, one million percent true. Uh, if he would have just hit expectation in the touchdown column, he would have been a fine fantasy draft pick. But at the same time. His, his volume was way, way high. Efficiency really was not very strong for Pollard last year. I think that he might just work better in more of a tandem. And I don't think we're going to see that efficiency happen and hit as he gets older slash as he's not in that Dallas system. And then, yeah, with Derrick Henry, I don't think you can really bet against Derrick Henry at this point, right? Like, it's just it just seems like a foolish thing to do. But I will say it's it's an interesting year for these free agent running backs because, you know, yes, there's competition with amongst themselves. And the fact that it's a pretty decent free agent class, but the running back draft class isn't very strong. So teams might right. be sitting there saying, oh, man, we can't get a blue chip prospect to just throw in their guy in the second round that we know can can carry the workload for us. Um, and so they might end up not necessarily overpaying for these guys, but they might end up finding teams where they have better workloads than we expect. 
that's kind of where I'm at too, because I have, we'll talk about the draft class here in a second. And you know, you'll be doing a lot more of the heavy lifting when we come to these running back prospects. Cause <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've done 0.0 research on running back prospects, but some of these teams that have a ton of cap space and, and are maybe cl- not close to contention, but teams that are at least interesting and, and need that running back to maybe kind of add a little bit more to their offense. Yeah, the, there's no draft class. There's the salary cap went up thirty million dollars more than was expected. It was a mm-hmm. huge boost. Like these guys aren't going to come out and break the bank, but I definitely think this is a conversation I want to have going into free agency. Of is there going to be more of a running back market than there was last year? I think last year maybe could have been an outlier because of not look it, the position is in a bad spot, and we all know that, right? Like that's not changing. That they're they're in a tough spot from a salary standpoint and what they can make. Uh, on the open market just because of the history and the replaceability of the position. There's no way really getting around that. But this year could be unique because of that draft class. And we see this all the time when there is sort of this understanding that, hey, it's a weaker class. It does impact the veteran free agency market. And I think running back's a really good spot to point it out this year. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's move into the prospects, buddy. But before we do, uh, let's talk about the combine just generally. You and I have been around for a long time now doing this fantasy thing, which is weird to say, but uh, it, it 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 is the case. And I feel like the fantasy industry and maybe honestly just the NFL scouting community has kind of gone through a lot of different phases with how much we should value the combine. You know, there's been some people for basically since uh, since I've been consuming football media that's it's underwear Olympics. It doesn't matter. Trust the tape, whatever. Um, you know, but then there's other few people that really still value that athletic testing data from your perspective, JJ, does the combine matter? How much should it matter? And especially with things changing, and we could talk about some individual guys this year, but with things kind of seemingly changing about the combine process, how much do people that want to learn about prospects and understand prospects even care about what's going to happen over the next few weeks? Or over the next few days. Yeah, look, I I think it's fine to watch to see what these guys generally like, like what their vibes are, right? Like you can you you can watch a wide receiver do their drills and sort of get an idea of the type of wide receiver he is, the kind of hands that he has, etc. That's fine. As someone who models this stuff in fantasy football, um, I can tell you that the most important input that I'm concerned about this weekend is running back weight, probably. Like that that's that. (laughs) That's the thing that like just the way in yeah. the way in for running back. And then people will say, oh, it's inflated or oh, this or that. But but it's a standardized way of me getting the measurements for this running back class. That's really all that mm-hmm. it comes down to, because you're going to get measurements from Kentucky that are totally different than measurements from Alabama, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, for real, though, like, you know, running back 40 times when you adjust for weight, that does have some meaning. Tight ends. I, you know, I, I finally started prospecting tight ends last year. And now this year it's going to be in my prospect guide. Uh, tight end oh, 40 times and, and weight adjusted 40 times do matter quite a bit. So uh, I don't think it's that surprising because when you look at the fantasy football landscape and you look at tight ends who have been good historically, like the elite tight ends, they're almost always, you know, 80th, 90th percentile athletes and, and uh, weight adjusted 40 time uh, is one sort of like proxy and way to see if a guy is athletic or not. So uh, yeah, there, you know, 40 times I am looking at, I'm concerned about, and then the other thing that we have to note, too, is even if I'm not getting signal like wide receiver, for instance, in my in my prospect models, zero athleticism measurables at all in those models. Like, I don't care mm-hmm. if the dude runs a fast 40, slow 40, what his agility score is, any of that kind of stuff. What but but I will say it's just because the model itself doesn't get signal from that. But draft capital does change based on how these guys perform at the combine and draft capital is an input in the model. It would be silly if it wasn't an input in the model. So. You know, there there is some uh, there has been some work done and I've seen it, too, where, uh, you know, when, when you analyze like second and third round wide day two wide receivers in particular, uh, a lot of times the correlation uh, is almost negative uh, when you look at their athleticism versus their actual production in the NFL, because a lot of times these guys are getting steamed up because of their athleticism. And that's not the thing that they should be steamed up for. Right. The athleticism mm-hmm. piece just really doesn't matter that much. But even still. It can help their draft capital a little bit. And that is something that goes into these models. But, you know, just it's one of those events where it's just enjoy it. Get to know the prospects names a little bit better, what they look like, their builds, all that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with having that information. 
Yeah, nothing wrong with it. Uh, I do think there is a danger in potentially overreacting to it, uh, mm-hmm. which you just perfectly outlined there. Also, I mean, just from the enjoy it factor, look, why are any of us into sports? I mean, a big part of it right. is to see freakishly athletic people do really crazy uh, <laughs> stuff, which is what's going to happen at the combine. Uh, right. There's there's not as much stakes behind it as like a real game or anything. But yeah, look, like whether it moves the needle on his draft stock or not, or should tell us about his game or not. Like if somebody, uh, DK Metcalf, uh, ironically a guy that fell in the draft, if DK Metcalf is going to go out there and bust off some crazy ass 40, I want to see it and yeah. I want to react to it. Right. Right, exactly. I, like, there's nothing wrong with like rooting for guys and hoping that they, you know, run really fast forties because it's an entertainment thing. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, shoot, people bet on this stuff now, which is yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not there yet. I, I'm not gonna tell. I don't tell anybody how to live their life. Okay, I don't, <laughs> I don't tell anybody what to do with their money. But it's an interesting choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. But whatever. Regardless, it's all part of having fun. It's it, it can be a really fun event. And yeah, I think that's interesting about like which metrics matter. And and then especially the point about draft cat- capital, man, because you're right that even whether it's logical or not, if it does matter to teams, it does have to matter to us. I think of it the same way as like, and I try to get myself out of this, but certain times people th- teams just like this guy's a slot receiver and he can only play in the slot and it's like ah, yeah i don't know man like i disagree yeah. because he could beat man coverage and all that but like if the team has their mindset yeah. on that it doesn't really matter running back same thing they think this guy can't you know pass protect on third down well then he's going to be an early down banger or like a early down explosive back and that's really all that matters and i that's kind of where i am wondering if the winds are changing a little bit just because you see guys and again we'll talk about certain examples this year like opting out of of drills or just completely opting out of the combine in general. And a lot of teams saying like, wow, we don't care about the 40 yard dash because we have the GPS numbers. That's where I'm interested. If like we're having a very different conversation about it, like five or 10 years from now, you know, uh, God willing, we're still doing this, man. Yeah. I mean, we might, we definitely might. And and I I do think that like the tracking stuff, if that were readily available to us and easy to to get college tracking data like that, then I would love to use the college tracking data instead of like having to rely on weight adjusted 40 time at running back. Right. I mean, like the tracking stuff, this is just, you know, I know it's a tangent a little bit, but like the tracking stuff is why the Rams have Puka Nakua. They, they, yes. they realize that he tested poorly. His game and speed Cooper was, Cup, by the way, and Cooper yeah, yeah, Cup. This yeah. Is, yeah. They te- like tested poorly. Puka did. And, and they knew that he was faster uh, when he played. And I think that's the thing when, you know, I talk to people about prospecting uh, through data in general is that they assume that, you know, I like take these numbers and I to heart and like I I'm, I don't move off of them or anything like not at all. Like that's not at all what I'm 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 looking at here. Like if if, if there are better answers out there, then then let's go with the better answers. This is not a very, very strict process. Prospect, pr- prospecting through data to me is all about it being a guide and then me mm-hmm. asking questions and finding answers based on the things that the data is saying. Well, perfect transition because the next question I was going to ask you is really kind of for the people who aren't familiar uh, with what you do prospecting through data and your process, kind of like give us a full rundown of, of everything, key metrics that matter, um, you know, what, where you can find like differentiation between your process and, and something that like more what I'm doing or somebody that's just strictly watching these guys kind of d- take us through the whole thing. Yeah. Look, so, so like I said, I think that when, when someone hears that I'm prospecting these players through data, they imagine that I likely in this nerdy dude, which isn't that part's not wrong. Who lives in his mom's <laughs> basement. That part's not wrong either. Uh, sure. yep. who, who has like take lock based on what the numbers are saying. I, you know, I'm, I can't move off of uh, this guy's really low yards per team pass attempt number or something like that. that's not it at all. That's not it mm-hmm. at all. So what this is, the premise here is that there are lots of traits that successful r- running back wide receivers and tight ends in the NFL shared when they were in college. Right. If every, and of course, there's a correlation causation thing. Like if every good wide receiver ranks chocolate chip cookies as their number one favorite cookie, I would not say that we need to draft wide receivers only who have chocolate chip cookies as their favorite cookie. Uh, but a guy likes sugar cookies, red flag. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Red flag. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. That's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying here is there are football related things that clearly there is some sort of causality there and reason to dig in further. Right. 
So with each of these models, I have three of them. I have one at wide receiver, running back and tight end. Haven't done quarterback yet because it is impossible to solve. Um, yeah. But with 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 uh, with each of these models, there's about six to eight inputs per position. Uh, one of those inputs for every single one is draft capital. So draft capital matters a little bit more at running back, let's say, than wide receiver, than tight end. Tight end draft capital matters the least of all of them. Um, mm. But with running back, for instance, I'll look at things like age, like the age that the running back is when he's entering the league. Uh, running back weight, which I said, which doesn't mean that I didn't like Devon Achan last year. It's nothing. It's just it's it's an input. It's one of the things mm -hmm. that these things are looking at. Um, and then there's something that I created this offseason called breakout score that I use for both running back and wide receiver. Now, running back breakout score is the it, it gives you different thresholds based on total yards per team play which is a metric that it's just literally a guy's total yards divided by the number of plays his college team ran. It takes uh, a season that he had and it looks at his age when he had a particular hit, hit a, a particular threshold. And then it creates this breakout score out of 100 to say this guy broke out, you know, early, has a good breakout, age adjusted production, or he didn't. At wide receiver, it's the same deal, uh, but it looks at yards per team pass attempt, which is a really, really good predictive number at wide receiver. So a guy... Uh, you know, receiving yards divided by number of pass attempts that a team had. So uh, it's looking at those factors and it's sort of bringing them all together, spitting out a score and saying, this is how good this player appears to be. Now, I don't stop there. Like I'm still watching these guys. I'm still texting you and talking about these players to make sure that what this is saying, what I think is really helpful is when the model, like last year's a perfect example, Matt, where I, I look at what my model's saying. I'm like, man, Jaden Reed, one of his top comps in the model right now is Stefan Diggs. It, yeah. Am I going crazy? Like, is this what's going on here? I text you. You look at, at Jaden Reed. You're like, holy crap, Jaden Reed's pretty good. And then all of a sudden you have multiple angles looking at this player. And both of those angles are saying, hey, this guy's a really good football player. And then it gives us both more confidence to go out and say, Jaden Reed's this dude, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Like it's, it's, it's a, like, I, I think that when you're approaching this, there's so many ways to go about scouting. It's fine to take bits and pieces from everywhere and say, I like what Matt Waldman's saying about this, or I like what Matt Harmon's saying about this. And then my model is saying this. If you can create a really strong narrative behind a player, you should have more confidence in that player in fantasy football. No, that's a great way of putting it. And it's why, like when I get questions about, um, like guys statistical profiles or whatever in college when i get those questions uh, on on twitter or, or, or social media or in my discord or whatever i'm always pointing people to to your prospect guide um and it's why i have you on the show right now because i think you do a good job of painting like a broad picture of this stuff and not just like harping on and you know because we see this stuff like harping on one metric or one result yeah. or, or whatever and and I think that can lead you to kind of hyper focus on something that maybe you end up missing the forest for the trees. And and Jaden Reed's a great example of like, yeah, shoot, I, I, you were kind of the first one to to point out like, what do you what do you know about this Jaden Reed guy? And, and you know, he was not ranked highly uh, on a lot of sources. No. And I'm not saying I am not sitting here saying so. Don't come into my mentions about this that JJ and I were the only ones on Jaden Reed Island or anything. There were certainly other people that liked Jaden Reed, but. He was like when he went in the second round of the Packers, people were kind of like, oh, second round pick for for mm -hmm. Jaden Reed, which, of course, in your model is going to boost him up from a draft capital standpoint. Right. But, yeah, that sort of I, it's like kind of consensus building, really, between like different ways of approaching it, that that's how I like to do this as well. Yeah. And look, I think that when you peruse Twitter and you look at people who are scouting with data and I don't say this is like, look at me, I have a model that's ridiculous, but I do think what having. Uh, uh, something that has been tested and something that's sort of all encompassing as opposed to looking at one singular metric. It's very, very helpful because when someone's deficient in something, he can then be better at something else and it'll still raise right. his profile enough. Right. Whereas a lot of people will like when Chris Olave came out, he wasn't an early declare wide receiver and look early declare status historically. Now it's getting a little bit iffy because of NIL deals and the COVID season ruined things a little bit, yeah. but regardless, yeah. like, Early declare status has gotten signal in the past. It does matter to some degree if a player is coming out early or if he's not coming out early. And it's okay to say that that's a thing, that there's signal there. The problem is when you then take that and you say, I refuse to draft Chris Olave in my rookie draft because he didn't come out early. Like it's there, there were so many good marks to his age adjusted profile, 
the stuff that you were seeing with him. Like there was no reason to then fade Chris Olave because of that one singular metric. But that is a metric that pushed him down maybe below a Garrett Wilson in a mile or what, what have you. Like it, there's, there's reasons as to why it did matter to some degree, but he was still a very, very good player. So I do think that when you have the totality of a model like that, it allows you to just see the greater picture. And, and, and really, you know, I, I like writing the profiles that I do in the prospect guide because it allows me to sort of generate this narrative uh, and story around these players as to why they did what they did, why things ended up and, and looked the way they look. And then at the end, say, this guy's good, this guy's not. Or I think this guy's going to be a good player or he's not going to be a good player. And that, 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 I think, is more important than just looking at a singular metric and being like, oh, his yards per team pass attempt sucked. Not going to draft him now. Yeah, like uh, <laughs> there are definitely some times I want to wage a holy war against yards per team pass attempts. So no, I I, I'm because yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like I mean I think everything can, can, needs to be put into context, and that's kind of what we're, we're we're saying here. Um, I mean, shoot, like teammates who you play with that can really come into a factor with this, and and Olave is I think a good example of that. Um, but yeah, man, it's honestly I didn't really put this together truthfully until we're talking about it, but. The way that you're saying this, where there's all this, like you can scout with data and you can prospect with data and all this, but I think putting it into a model or just again the total picture of, yeah, he's deficient in this one area, but that means he can be really good in this area. It's not really too dissimilar to kind of what I'm trying to do with reception perception. Cause right. same with when you see people kind of scouting with data where you're kind of like, nah, that I don't really love that. That was my whole point with why I wanted to chart receivers this way was. All right, I mean, you're telling me this guy's like a really good route runner, but what does that mean? And like, how does that measure against like everybody else who's a really good route runner? And like, right. he's a good route runner against man coverage, but what about, what about zone coverage? He's a good route runner short, but what about deep? You know, so like being able to put all these things together. And um, I don't have like one final score with perception, perception for, for a lot of different reasons, but it's sort of similar to like, okay, yeah, he's, he's, this guy is not good against man coverage, either in the NFL or, or, or in, in, in college. That doesn't have to be a death knell to his right. profile, but like we need to see him pop in a different area, which you know certainly yes. can happen with with certain players. Yes, hundred percent. And there's a lot of examples of that in this class. All right, perfect. Well, let's t- let's talk this class and any other show that you like. Let's t- let's start with quarterbacks. No, let's, no. Let's start. Let's start with quarterbacks. We're gonna start at the wide receiver position. One because this is my show, and two. Uh, because it's an extremely tantalizing position this year, especially in the top three. Now, I think everybody ha- seems to have a consensus that there are a top three, and you'll, I'm sure you'll find outliers, whatever. Um, but most most everybody kind of in some way, form or fashion, in some order, has Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunze in their top three. Before we talk about these three guys specifically, I just want you to tell me um, from like a profile standpoint, th- these guys are the three best in, in the class, right? And and is there a gap for you to everybody else? Yeah, so it's, it's a really good question. Uh, right now, the way things look, because things can change based on draft capital and such. And, and, and I do have a teammate score, which is very, very important for mm. Roma Dunze because he played obviously with two other guys coming out this year. Uh, neighbors also playing with Brian Thomas. And then, you know, Marvin Harrison gets a little bit of a boost because he played with like JSN last year and stuff. Right. Um, so, so there is a teammate score that's in the model that gets signal. And so what's important about that is that's actually driven off of draft capital of his, t- of their teammates. And so mm. where those teammates actually get drafted can help or not help, you know, these players scores a little bit. So I do want to preface with that right now, Marvin Harrison and Malik neighbors are the elite of the elite in this class. And there is a gap then to Roma Dunze, but Roma Dunze, so the way that the the the, the model, it's a ZAP model, it's called Z-A-P. Uh, it's re- really, really uh, creative uh, name for Zacharyson adjusted prospect model. Um, <laughs> and so, and so, so in the ZAP model, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. has a 99.3 score. That's out of 100. Uh, Malik Neighbors has a 99.5 score. That's out of 100. And then Roma Dunze is at like 95.5. So hmm. I'll, I'll say that that n- anything 95 and above historically has been a very, very good score. Really, really elite. Once you get to 90 to 95, still very, very good. But you're talking more of like the uh, what we saw last year in that class, more sure. of like the Zay Flowers types uh, that you'll find in there. Uh, Quentin Johnson in this updated model is is under 90. I felt pretty good whenever I That's saw that nice, happen. Yeah. Um, but but uh, regardless... <laughs> 
you know, Marvin Harrison uh, Jr. and Malik Neighbors to me just analytically have a little bit more well-rounded profiles than Roma Dunze do. They both had better seasons in yards per team pass attempt, your favorite metric. Uh, you know, they they both have better breakout scores as a result of that. Uh, Malik Neighbors, man, his 2023 is out of control. Like for, yeah. from a production standpoint, from just analytically, and he's so young too. That, that's the other thing that I think we have to at least pay attention to when it comes to like dynasty and such is that, you know, not only is he producing the way that he did, he did it at a really young age and he's going to be entering at a really young age too. You just don't see that combo happen very frequently. There's nothing wrong with Roma Dunze. Like his top comp in my model is, is DeAndre Hopkins. But I think that I was texting you about this a little bit. And another comp that popped up was Michael Floyd. And I'm not saying mm. that that's where I think he's going. I'm saying if you look at Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison's comps, you know, Marvin Harrison, you're getting AJ Green and Julio Jones, these very, very elite of the elite wide receivers. Malik Neighbors, you're getting OBJ, DJ Moore, uh, Jabbar Chase was actually one of them too. And you're getting these, these players who are just like, can't miss. You want them on your fantasy squad. And the fact that there's just, you know, some question, some risk, you know, he's not an early declare Roma Dunze. His breakout score wasn't as good as those guys were. So analytically, he's just a little bit worse. But I do think that he's still a very, very good prospect. Like in last year's class, he would have been probably in line with like a JSN from what the what the model is saying. Uh, and I, I wouldn't even be surprised if he ends up getting top 10 draft capital. If he would have gotten that last year, probably would have ranked him ahead of JSN. Oh, yeah. I think for me, I, just from what I've seen so far of him, I think he's a better prospect than, than yeah. JSN. Um, let me let me run this take by you because uh, I've been sort of formulating this in, in my head that I feel like these top three guys. Um, now, maybe analytically, a Dunze is not quite there with these other t- two guys, sure. uh, neighbors and, and Marvin Harrison. But generally, these guys are to me are all top 10 worthy guys. I'm going to, when I come out with my rankings prior to the draft, like stacked up with previous classes, they're going to be grouped right up there as, as top 10 worthy picks in the NFL draft. And that's, that's great. I feel like it's going to be very similar to 2022, honestly, mm-hmm. when people went to war about Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson and Drake London, it's like, yo, these are all good players. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And at the end of the day, they're probably all going to get picked in the top 10. I think Drake London did get picked in the top 10. Garrett Wilson was right there. And Chris Olave, like all those guys could have been top 10 picks and wouldn't have, wouldn't have batted an eye. It feels like a waste of time really to do this like Agreed. Malik Neighbors versus Marvin Harris. Like he's my wide receiver one and look at what a, what a bold take I have. Sure, you can have that taken. That's fine because Malik Neighbors is really, really good. Marvin Harrison's also really, really good. And I think Adunze is right there with those guys too. It feels very similar to that year where it's like, I, I know at the end of the day, yes, like the teams will have to, well, they'll have to make draft picks. And when it comes time to do rookie drafts, I, I, in my opinion, it'll come down to situation and where these guys are at because, yeah. um, you know, one guy goes to the Giants and he's going to be stuck with Daniel Jones. I'm gonna like that a lot less than, uh, shoot, somebody that goes uh, to a different spot that maybe has a more clear cut quarterback situation or offensive coordinator situation. So that's just kind of where I stand right now with these three guys is that. I want to appreciate all of them for being extremely good prospects. And again, where you want to end up taking them or where they fit best probably just comes down to what you value like traits wise at the wide receiver position. Yeah, I'd agree. And I also think that that it's really easy to assume that these guys are like flawless, given the way that we're talking about them and, oh, and yeah. the way that, that that folks talk about them. But like, you know, like Marvin Harrison Jr. does not have a good yards after the catch profile, for instance. Right. Mm. Or Malik neighbors. You have to at least question uh, was some of this production a, a little bit inflated because he had a pretty high slot rate last season. I was just, that was just and, about to ask you that. Yeah. 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 And, and like that to me is somewhat of a red. Now, now to be fair, we've seen other elite beyond elite LSU wide receivers have a, a big slot. Justin role. Jefferson. Right. Anybody. <laughs> right. Like we've, we've seen this happen before, so let's not like take it too far. But at the same time, I do think that like, like there are reasons to, not assume these guys are just like like they they have no flaws or like nothing can go wrong. But oh, what yeah. we're saying is at the end of the day, like like this is a, a very like these are cornerstone dynasty pieces. Uh, if you're able to get them in your rookie drafts, yeah. Like over since the 2021 class, I've only handed out five like top ten worthy uh, grades, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. Jamar Chase, Chris Olave, Devonta Smith, Drake London, and Garrett Wilson. And I do think that these guys fit in that bucket of player to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, 
I th- man, it's funny you bring up like Marvin Harrison and and yards after catch, and because the guy to compare him to is like a Jamar Chase, who is a better prospect coming out. Chase was crazy, man, because he was just so good at literally everything. Like he was a, above average to elite at every single part of playing the wide receiver position, and he did it at X receiver, like purely X receiver. Never mm-hmm. because Jeff Jefferson was always in the slot. Right. What a, what an insane like profile that guy had coming to the NFL. And obviously he's been a great player. Um, but yeah, all these three guys, I think you can pick certain nits at them, not just from an analytical perspective, but on film. Cause I definitely yeah. think with neighbors is, is the route running like all the way there? Maybe not, but he is very similar to like a DJ Moore type where DJ Moore was super young coming into the league, just like Malik neighbors. Um, DJ Moore took a minute to get there from the route running stuff, but he had all of the, you know, burst and ability to kind of like, you know, to stop start that really made you feel he would get there. And the, the reception perception profile on DJ Moore was actually really good uh, in college. It was just like year one. It kind of took a minute to get there. So they feel very similar to me, but yeah, it's, it's a great top three. And I just want to encourage listeners to this podcast and viewers of this show. Don't engage in like the, knock down drag out fights like this guy versus this guy like yeah, appreciate yeah. these players for who they are and, and i think agreed. you end up with any of them on your dynasty team you're gonna feel pretty good about it agreed totally agreed so let's move after that group because i think this is where it gets interesting i'll just throw out some names here um well actually let's first talk about brian thomas jr who is i would say the consensus wide receiver for for most people that like if you look at mock drafts he's typically the next one off the board um I think like he's got a pretty solid standing there. How does he sort of profile out an- analytically? Yeah, look, I I won't lie. In the Zap model, he looks uh really good. Like not too too far off from Roma Dunze right now. And mm-hmm. part of the reason for that is he's an early declare. He had really he had an unbelievable 2023 alongside Malik Neighbors. And I know that people hear that and they're like, oh well, the offense was really good. Yeah, that's that's not wrong. Quarterback play can certainly help even with yards per team pass attempt. But a lot of these numbers are market share related numbers. So they're giving you these numbers in the context of their offense. I'm not just looking at like raw data and saying this guy, I mean, like if that were the case, then we'd be looking at guys from like Oregon last year only, uh, you know, like Troy Franklin, <laughs> would be a, the wide yeah. receiver one in the class. Uh, so I, 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 I do think though the problem with Brian Thomas, and this is why I like to look at statistical comps because if you can find strong statistical comps on top of a strong overall score, then you can just feel more confident in that player coming out. Problem with mm-hmm. Thomas is there's not a lot of close matches to his profile when you're looking at his size and, and sort of what he did on the production front. Uh, and then you look at like how he broke out where uh, he really only had the one good season uh, at LSU from like a yards per team pass attempt, et cetera, standpoint. Now, obviously he's playing at LSU. He's playing against with, with good competition, uh, but it was really hard to, 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 to get super close matches to his profile. And Quentin Johnston is his, his top match right now in that that model which is scary obviously you know you get you get qj as a top comp you know he can stretch the field uh another comp that popped up which i think might be pretty accurate fairly accurate of like what he might do in the nfl was tory smith where Hmm. uh you know he could be a semi-high volume guy but maybe not really get to the level that we're talking about with the three others in the class uh but he can stretch the field he can get down the field and use athleticism and use his size right and that's what we saw with tory smith throughout his entire career. So, you know, it's just a matter of like what kind of preference you have. I do think he's a very, very solid prospect though. And he's better than some of the other guys that have been thrown out as at least analytically as, you know, late first uh, into that early second round. This is why I really do like draft season um, because I'm sure people listen to this podcast here. You say like, oh yeah, he's got a Tory Smith comp and they're immediately like, Ugh, gross like because we just remember yeah. players for what they were at the very end of their career yes like i i kind of i like i kind of think uh roma dunze reminds me a little bit of like an alan robinson type but like people think of alan robinson like the last two years it's like that's a disaster but i mean I, this is a guy who scored 14 touchdowns in the nfl right. one time and tory smith like he had 841 yards, seven touchdowns, 855 yards, eight touchdowns, 1,128 yards and four touchdowns in his first three career seasons in the right. NFL. Like, right. let me tell you what, folks, Brian Thomas gets drafted by the damn, you know, Bills in the first round or something like that. I mean, that, that'd be awesome. But 
He gets drafted by some team in the mid first round. He puts up those three, uh, no, those three stat lines to start his career as like a number two receiver. Because I, I kind of think he's more of a, a two that could develop yeah. into a one at some point. Yeah, you, people are gonna feel whoever t- the team that drafts him gonna feel really good about that result. Yeah, yeah, I I agree, and and that's the thing. Like all the comps that I do within my guide and and uh with with every profile, I don't give you like only comps that are like high end and that you're going to know the players. I mean, there are guys that pop up because the database goes back to 2011. And it's every wide out and running back who was drafted or went to the combine since 2011. Some of the guys, I don't even know who they are. I have to like Google them to see who, because it's like this random yeah. undrafted combine participant from 2011. I'm like, I don't remember who this guy is. And so like, I'm trying to give more realistic outcomes for these guys with these comps. And I do think that a, player like Torrey Smith and that kind of outcome makes enough sense for Brian Thomas. Yeah, I love that part of reading your prospect guide every year. And, and if you're listening to the show, you should you should pre-order JJ's prospect guide. We'll talk more about that at the end of the show, but you should make sure you're reading it every year. I, I mean, I love reading it for a lot of different reasons, but see, part part of it secretly is just like, yeah, I love to I love to remember some dudes. I love to remember right, like some right. guys. Yeah, even even if it's all the way back in 2011, like that right. was so so long. Feels let me tell you what feels like a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago. I still like to remember all those players. Uh, so that's the fun part about draft season and JJ's prospect guide in particular. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm kind of with you on Brian Thomas, sort of being like, there's definitely a drop off from those main guys to him, and and I do think. Good player. I would absolutely um he's probably the actually the last one, just on my early kind of view of this receiver class. He's kind of the last one that I think is a clear cut first round pick. Yeah. Um, that's sort of just where I'm at with him right now. Agreed. Uh and next group of guys here before we kind of just talk about maybe some more dark horse players. Keon Coleman, Lad McConkey, uh AD Mitchell, Troy Franklin, Roman Wilson, Malachi Corley. These are other guys that I see generally getting like late round one or early round two buzz. Um, is there anyone here that really stands out to you from an analytical perspective? Yeah, a, a lot of them have incredibly interesting profiles. I'll literally go quickly with each one because I think that okay. each one has something, something at least that's that's interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll start with Keon Coleman. This is directly an excerpt from the prospect guide this year. It says, let's start with his breakout score. It's 56.6 from 2011 to 2021. So I'm looking at players who had played at least three years in the league already. We saw 27 wide receivers get drafted between pick 20 and pick 40. That's around the area of the draft where Coleman's projected to get selected. Of those 27, seven had breakout scores below 60. Okay. So we're looking at wide receivers drafted between pick 20 and 40 since 2011 who had breakout scores below or, or at or below where Keon Coleman's at. Here are the wide receivers. Brian Quick, Cordero Patterson, Kelvin Benjamin, Brashad Perriman, Philip Dorsett, Josh Doxson, and Jalen Rager. So we're we're not looking great. Not with a great Coleman. list. It's uh it, it's it's Keon <laughs> Coleman really looks like the standard uh late first round bust in this draft. And, mm. and I, I say bust from the standpoint, like I I he looks a lot like Brashad Perriman. Like, like that is mm. that is by far the 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 top comp for him uh i have a lot of worry now there is some positive he played at michigan state last year two years ago i guess at this point uh and he outperformed Jaden reed at michigan state and a lot of people are going to throw that out there and say oh he's better than Jaden reed at michigan Jaden reed played injured for a lot of that final season um and and even still you're you have to give Jaden Reed's season some context too. Jaden Reed wasn't that great his se- like his final season. Like his numbers weren't that fantastic. So him being better than not so great doesn't mean that, you know, he's he's all of a sudden good. Jaden Reed broke out very very early in college and then things just kind of like leveled out, but he had a lot of other traits that made him uh an interesting prospect. With Lad McConkey, he has one of the weirdest profiles because his yards per team pass attempt usually correlates pretty strongly to yards per route run but not for McConkey because McConkey was not used very much at Georgia. He, he was fifth in, in, uh, in routes run at Georgia last year. Um, and so you're looking at a situation where whether it was due to how they handle personnel injury or game script, because obviously Georgia is a good football program. Uh, you know, McConkey's just very, very difficult to prospect analytically. I don't mind him. Uh, I, it's just one of those players that I'm going to have to lean on some of the film analysis, I think a little bit more than draft capital uh, to see where I, where I really like him. Uh, A.D. Mitchell, uh, good size, but a really poor analytical profile. Now, he played with good competition throughout college at Georgia and then Texas. 
um, but his numbers really were not strong at all. We have almost zero hits around his draft capital range with his yards per team pass attempt number, uh, with his breakout score number. Uh, he just does not look that great analytically, but he actually grades out okay in the model because of all the other factors, his early declare status, his teammate score, all that kind of stuff. So he's okay enough, but he's not someone that I'm probably going to be like actively targeting heavily. Troy Franklin, uh, you know, really solid, younger, wide out. He can get down the field. His comps analytically are DJ Chark and Calvin Ridley, but he's younger than Calvin Ridley. Uh, but he can be sort of that like down the field, deeper threat. Um, and, you know, he, he looks he looks good enough analytically. And then Roman Wilson, uh, I was scared of him at first uh, analytically. But when you dig in a little bit more, you know, you give his numbers a little bit of context with the low passing volume in the Michigan offense. And then again, you lean on some of the film analysis. I can see an avenue to him being sort of like a wide receiver too in fantasy. But the last one I really want to talk about is Malachi Corley. The Malachi okay. Corley stuff is fascinating to me because you get these Debo Samuel comps everywhere from people, right? Oh. Like this is the Debo Samuel of this class, which if you were to take a wide receiver from this class and say he's Debo Samuel, 100% it's Malachi Cordley. The dude has that dog in him. He is just destroying defenders after the catch. The problem is like threefold. Number one, he went to Western Kentucky. He went to a smaller program, right? That That's, that's an issue because usually, you know, you're playing against weaker competition and, uh, you know, typically smaller school guys don't work out as well in the NFL, even when you adjust for draft capital. Now, the other thing that's a problem is his numbers still weren't very good, despite going to a small school. That That's not a good sign when his max season yards per team passing him was 2.08. And, uh, you know, elite wide receivers can generally get to three in that metric. So, like, there, there are some question marks there. And then you dig into how they used him. Tons of screens, uh, you know, tons of, of, of catches behind the line of scrimmage, which you can sit there and say, well, that's what Malachi Corley does well, is that he can get down the, or he can uh, you know, do stuff after the catch, but that doesn't tell you enough about what he's capable of, right? Like we don't, we just, we just don't know. And it's okay to say, we don't fully know. The Debo Samuel comp, I think is fair enough as like a high, high, high end comp, but Debo Samuel objectively was a better prospect, like way better marks across the board, better breakout score. Like Debo Samuel was a good prospect, Malachi Corley has a lot of red flags. To me, his number one comp, this just gives you the, the wide range and where this could go with Malachi Corley, but his, his, his realistic comp is Amari Rogers, who came out a few years ago, who, by the what way, a range. Go, yeah, exactly. Amari, he could be Amari Rogers or Debo Samuel, but that's what we're working on. When you get a smaller school guy who ran a lot of screens and did a lot after the catch, this is the kind of like realistic outlook that you have for a player like that. But the thing that's crazy is when you say Amari Rogers, people are like, oh, you're an idiot. Like you're, you're so, but go Google Amari Rogers, Debo Samuel. That, that is who people were comping Amari Rogers to when he was coming out. I mean, it's a, it was a real thing with, with his top comp. So um, I, I do have some concern about Corley translating. It's not that he can't translate. It's just that we don't know because there's just a lot of question marks. I've got a, uh, I've I've got a uh, couple of hits here right now. Packers trying to create their own version of Debo Samuel. If they draft go. Amari Rogers, uh, Amari Rogers go. draft and combine pros, uh, prospect profile. Sources tell us I love his value because you can play him like San Francisco uses Debo Samuel. <laughs> I mean, he's <laughs> not is. wrong. <laughs> you are you are not there wrong. You is. type that into the Google machine and you get it. And look, I I'll say this disclaimer: I have not charted malachi corley let, yet so i don't i don't know whether he can do more than that stuff but like yeah the debo samuel comp to me i'm not even saying it's like a kiss of death but it's not a it does not move the needle for me if you're going to compare somebody no. to debo samuel dude. because it's I mean, shoot dude there were there were people comping tra trailing burks to the next debo samuel which like you can shoot shoot that stuff into the sun because that was nuts at the time but it's just like would debo samuel even be doing the like production wise with Debo Samuel's doing in any other anywhere offense? else. No, I don't know. I don't know. Probably stop. not. No, we got to stop. Dude. Valus Jones was being comp to, to Debo Samuel. There's a, an entire bears Reddit thread about how I'm a moron for saying that Valus Jones was one of the worst day two picks in my prospect models history, because everyone in the comments section is saying that he's the bears version of Debo Samuel. Like we gotta, we gotta just like yeah. cool our jets a little bit with the Debo stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, you definitely shouldn't uh, be mean to Valus Jones. He's turning thirty this year, so um, <laughs> <laughs> you got to got to cool it with the with the Valus Jones stuff. But yeah, no, they, it, that is just often a profile that does trick people for sure. Um, I'm interested to to learn more about Ad Mitchell. This is the one guy that just wanted to mm. focus on there that you talk about because. From what I've seen, just a couple limited games, I, I think he does have like legit X receiver yes, traits, which which is super valuable because, man, you look at like last year's draft class, there was not a lot of X, a lot of good players, not a lot of X receivers. This year, we definitely have some guys. I mean, even the, the first three guys that we talked about, Malik Neighbors, maybe not as much, but I still think he has the traits to be a guy that wins out at X receiver. Brian yeah. Thomas, maybe if he develops, he does. He has that as well. So I do think that's a guy that's going to be fascinating to track. And I think I'm interested to see where he ends up in your final kind of your scoring here, just because the teammate stuff is, is a big factor yeah. here. The fact he played for two big programs. I don't know. He is somebody and he's a guy that I think has been at least I've noticed a lot of other film watchers kind of like boosting him up yes. in, as we get into the process. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing too, that, that my model does not account for that. Maybe it should, and maybe I can dig into it a little bit more with more and more transfers. Like I'm, I'm writing the profiles for these guys in this class. There's 39 wideouts going to the combine and I'm writing these profiles and literally like every single one transferred at some point, like, like it, it's just oh, crazy yeah. how, and, and I, I do think that there is something, this is subjective and, and this is not baked into my model whatsoever. But I do think there's something to say about, you know, A.D. Mitchell was at Georgia for a couple of years. Then he played at Texas last year. Texas has good pass catchers that he played with, to be fair. And so, you mm -hmm. know, his teammate scores are looking great, all that good stuff. But you have to wonder if there's an acclimation period for these guys who are transferring and not playing at a program for more than a year. And so I do think that there are more subjective things with A.D. Mitchell that I'm cool with. Um, and again, like the 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 way the model is set up now is that I am able to look at historical numbers and say if a prospect score and where he's being drafted is a low risk, neutral or high risk profile. Right. And A.D. Mitchell's is actually neutral. So mm. it's not as high risk as I initially thought based on all of his production metrics. It's more so because all these other things uh, are pointing to him actually not being that bad. I love that uh, because, yeah, it's it, what we're talking about here is definitely once draft capital gets mixed into your model, certain guys will get that boost. But how much of a risk does that become like? Right. And that's what's just the tough part about the NFL draft generally, because we talk about Keon Coleman. I share a lot of your concerns with Coleman where um, he, he gives me like Chase Claypool vibes a yeah, little bit. 100%. But he but he has much he has much cooler contested catches than Chase Claypool ever did. He looks so, I'm look, he's fun to watch. Keon Coleman's really yeah. fun to watch. Yeah. Re really fun to watch. But like Keon Coleman at pick 15 to 20 feels right. in the NFL draft feels a lot different than like second round Keon yeah, Coleman. Yeah, 50 to you 60 know, or something. Yeah. Exactly. Something like that. So I like that that um that that's mixed in there. Uh before we toss to a break here, any other receivers you want to spotlight for people to keep their eye on during the combine week just as like, hey, this guy's prospect profile looks really good. Yeah, man, Xavier Worthy out of out of uh Texas, he's like a he's like a Marquise Brown plus potentially. Hmm. Uh his his profile is arguably the third best in this class analytically behind neighbors and behind Marvin Harrison Jr. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. Wow. It's just that he's thinner. You know, he's just got that like smaller, leaner build. And, you know, I, I think we've seen enough of those guys being able to translate in the NFL. And then the other thing with him, too, he's kind of got that like Rondell Moore production profile where he was like, I mean, Rondell Moore's was more so because he uh, got injured, you know, th throughout his Purdue career. But like, you know, he performed very, very well as a rookie. And then there's like more competition going on at Texas. The production's not quite as strong. So you have to question that a little bit. But overall, you know, I, I think that the, the 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 problem with a guy like Worthy is everyone in the fantasy industry is going to be high on him because most people will will look at stuff analytically. And so his ADP and like rookie drafts and such, probably you're you're not gonna get like a crazy value for him. That that's that's one of the the issues that you might run into. Another one, this is this is gonna be uh uh maybe a little bit hot takey. Ricky Pearsall out of out of Florida. Um, he's not someone that I think a lot of data driven analysts are going to be on. OK, and this is similar to what I felt like with Jaden Reed last year and what you're seeing in the media space and in the in the scouting space, uh, like DJ dropped his his most recent top 50 and he was in the top 50. Ricky Pearsall was. And so uh, he actually 
one of his comps when I was doing my, his, his profile a week and a half ago was Jaden Reed. Uh, you have a guy mm. who could now get steamed into the second round, you know, after being maybe like a day three guy, like a lot of people thought maybe in like January or December. Uh, similar builds between the two guys. Pearsall's maybe a little bit, a little bit thinner than, you know, Reed's pretty like compact in his build, um, but very similar analytical marks on the production side, uh, slightly older prospects. Uh, he played uh, five years in college. Jaden Reed was a little bit older as well. Um, and they, the, the thing that's really interesting is that they did it on like all levels of the football field, right? Like Jaden Reed, part of the, the reason I loved him is because he got rushing production. He had special teams production. Uh, he was playing in and out of the slot. He was playing everywhere. Ricky Pearsall's the exact same kind of way where uh, he's just lined up everywhere. You see him taking end arounds um, and he's really, really tough. Like we see with Jaden Reed too. So he's my Jaden Reed of this year's class. I hope that he doesn't get steamed up too much, um, but there's a chance that we end up seeing his name called on like earlier day two than we than we initially expected. Yeah, um, don't hold me to this because I'm not full done with my, his prospect profile yet from a reception perception standpoint. But I think the guy, I think he can play. I yeah, think, he looks I think good. He's, man. Yeah, I think he's pretty good. So uh, that's a good name for people to keep an eye on. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to run through eh, those other three positions that I guess matter as well. All right, we're back. Uh, JJ, you know, I know you said you don't have a quarterback model, um, which totally makes sense, but do at least want to hit on the quarterbacks in this draft and just kind of like where people are vibing with them right now. There's obviously a clear-cut consensus again you know you'll find people that have different opinions and different opinions are fine but for the most part clear top three of Caleb Williams Drake May Jaden Daniels and then like there's sort of four guys who could rock it up or or, or kind of go down sort of just based on how their draft process goes I think JJ McCarthy is kind of the uh, hottest of these names right now I think he seems like a guy who might end up going shoot in the top 12. There's Bo Nix. There's Michael Penix Jr. There's Spencer Rattler. Um, but those top three guys, you know, a- anything kind of to note on them uh, as players that make them interesting coming into the draft? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I always, obviously am looking at this from a fantasy football perspective. And so we want rushing out of our, our quarterbacks. Like we, we want that kind of production. So like a Jaden Daniels, if he falls to the right spot or if he like land... Like if he were to somehow find himself in Atlanta, for instance, let's just say if he doesn't go to the Patriots at three. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Like, like if he, if he, if he finds himself in this amazing offensive situation, I think that you're making an argument from a fantasy perspective that he's the one Oh one in super flex rookie drafts. Like I, I think mm. you're at least oh, making wow. that argument. Right. Uh, but I think that Caleb Williams, from what I've seen, from what people are saying, what people who scout quarterbacks better and more frequently than I do say, uh, he at least has the traits that you don't really want to miss out on that. I think the big question that we're going to run into is when you are doing rookie drafts in Dynasty, uh, are you, and it's super flex in particular, because obviously non super flex, you're not going to want to go after these quarterbacks, but are you going to want to take the more sure thing from a safety standpoint in a Marvin Harrison, in a Malik Neighbors, or are you going to want to go the quarterback route where? You know, there might be a little bit more upside from a value standpoint if that quarterback does hit, because as we know, uh, you know, the the top eight picks in a dynasty startup are quarterbacks in super flex leagues. It's not even till like pick nine where you get to like Justin Jefferson and stuff. So um, I, I think that's the the big question right now. I'd, I'd probably be going Williams at 101, but um, I do think there's at least a, a question with that with so many reasonable voices voicing a, a slightly negative opinion about him. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's really fascinating just about the weighing um, like a Marvin Harrison Jr. Or, or one of these great receiver prospects in against the quarterbacks because, you know, Caleb Williams, I definitely think he's not a flawless prospect, but he's got a lot of the traits you're looking for from like a high end starting quarterback, yeah. you know, ability to create out of structure. Um, I really like watching and charting Jordan Addison last year. Uh, I really ended up appreciating just a lot of what Caleb Williams did yeah. from a, from just an individual player perspective. And honestly, same thing for Drake may too. When I was charting and watching uh, Josh downs, I was like, and, and even some with, with Walker this year, uh, Tez Walker, who we didn't hit on. I'm like, man, <laughs> yeah. Drake may can play in my opinion. I, I really like Drake may a lot. So those two guys to me feel really set and secure from a prospect's profile standpoint. J- Jaden Daniels definitely, I think, will be landing spot sensitive, but you, you're right from a fantasy angle. He could be a guy that 
shoot, he goes to the right place and he's going to run a ton. I mean, he, he's going to get himself destroyed running a ton in the NFL if he runs like he did in college because that guy does not know how to not take like the the, the worst and most egregious hits yes. of all time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that has definitely been something watching these LSU receivers. I'm like, man, Jaden Daniels, bro, you – you, you, we, we got to chill or, or we're going to get crushed out here. Um, but yeah, I think all these three quarterbacks have uh, some level of appeal. I do really like what I've seen out of Williams in May so far. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 the other thing too, with the other guys, like a lot of times in just from like a game theory perspective, a lot of these quarterbacks in, in rookie drafts will slip through the cracks a little bit. Um, whenever they don't, if they don't get round one capital, um, and you can just throw that dart in round two and then hope that they get a starting gig uh, you know, the following year and you might be able to flip that for a nice little value. And then obviously they could just hit too. like, look at like what happened with Will Levis this past year, right? Where, you know, we don't know the answer to that, but his value has increased year over year just based on the small sample that we saw. Running back position, um, you kind of already touched on it, but all the talk is that this is a weak class that you, you, you feel that way as well. Yeah. I mean, I think though that there it's a weak class, but it's, it's weak at the top, right? Like I, yeah. I use this example when I talked about it on my podcast, um, whenever I did a, a running back episode, but this running back class doesn't have a single player in the nineties and zap score. So 90 or above every other running back class since 2011 had a running back that was at least 94 or better, uh, you know, in, in, in every single year. So e even the Bishop Sankey year, it wasn't Bishop Sankey, though. It was Jeremy Hill who had the the high. And Jeremy Hill had a couple, you know, handful of, of fine fantasy seasons. So I don't even think that was really a model miss. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the reason people see the running back class as they do, you know, it's I don't think it lacks depth per se, but I do think it definitely lacks like a high end talent in the class. I, Jeremy Hill, again. These these are like the, the name, you know, names. From remember, some guys. Jer remember, remember some guys. Jeremy Hill had weirdly 222 carries, 223 carries and 222 carries in his first three years. I mean, that yeah. is so identical. And, and I got to say, the model is only looking at projecting the first three years of a player's career. So, well, that's I all mean, that those th those three years, 1100 yards, nine touchdowns, 794 yards, an NFL leading 11 touchdowns there in his go. second season, 839 yards and nine touchdowns. Uh, and, you know, whatever receiving production. But yeah, man, Jeremy Hill yeah, was like, a, 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 that's a, that's a huge hit. This yeah. is, I'm not, we won't go on a long tangent about this, but, um, you know, we, we talked about that like, uh, slot or slot receiver production earlier um you know and how that can maybe inflate some prospect profiles i i saw scott barrett tweeting about this yesterday our mutual friend scott barrett he, he was tweeting about this and like you know he was some of, like some of his models misses like elijah moore wandale robinson i'm like like are those i know those guys aren't like big time fantasy contributors but like those guys don't suck. Like no, they're not they're good. bad. Yeah. It, it just depends on your expectations, right? Like, right. I, I, definitely. I, I think I was higher on Elijah Moore after his rookie year and what he could become. Sure. By the way, he's only, you know, only three years into his career he, and he's already changed teams, which is not ideal, but like Wanda Robinson's fine slot receiver. Like Elijah Moore's yeah. a fine receiver. I, I don't think anybody's looking at those guys like on the Cleveland Browns and be like, man, you know what our biggest problem on offense is? It's Elijah Moore, man. That, that, yeah. We, we got to get this guy out of here. But I do think I do think, though, and I, I try to layer this into my analysis. I do still say things like this guy played a lot in the slot in college. And it's as we know, players can go in or can go outside in, but going inside out, not the same kind of game. Right. And so knowing that then there could be li like Josh Downs. I love Josh Downs as a prospect. Like, I, I still like Josh Downs. Like, I still think same, he's very, yeah. very love good. Josh Downs. I think he's a buy if you can get him right now. But the, the, the thing that you have to still re recognize is that he played the majority of his snaps from the slot this past year, right? Like he has been a strictly slot guy. And so if this team, if they go out in 12 personnel and they're not running 11 personnel, Josh Downs might not be on the field very much, right? And then we need those players to be on the field to secure and score fantasy points. And then not only that, but if you're a slot only guy, you're competing with more wide receivers on the field when you are on the field. And maybe your target share is going to drop a little bit as a result of that too. So there are reasons to be a little bit hesitant of some slot players. And then you just have to hope that they can grow into something bigger. Like Cooper cup grew into something bigger, right? Like he became a, a, a monster where he can play inside out. And so I think it, I, I, I think it's a, the right call out to make about slot guys. 
Um, but you know, it's just more about like projection. Like Elijah Moore, the reason why I was in on him after year one was because he didn't play in the slot that much in year yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, like he won on the outside. That's why it was so awesome to see, and that's why it was easier to invest in him. And then, you know, things just got bad. But to the point though, and uh, like kind of what we said and uh, you know earlier is that what matters is what the teams think. And yes. like what the, what Cleveland did with Elijah Moore last year is this like kind of goofy gadget player. It's like, why well, no one needs this. And he okay? dominated and I, when they didn't. Yeah. I, I, right. And, and, and I kind and like Curtis Samuels, another guy that's kind of fallen into this trap too. It's like they end up getting sort of pigeonholed and, and that really does matter. Like you said, though, they just, these guys, if they ball out to an extreme degree, like a Cooper cup, they can become, become something different. My only point in bringing it back to the receiver stuff was just, like when we're talking about comps and 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 I just really want to hammer that home this draft season that like Torrey Smith, fine little NFL career, Jerry Jeremy Hill, fine NFL like yeah, moments yeah. there as a fantasy back. Like Wandale Robinson, f- that's that's fine. Like Elijah Moore, that's fine. These comps shouldn't necessarily be like, all right, this is well, if you're not gonna compare him to Derrick Henry, don't waste my time right, <laughs> when we're talking right. about the running back position. But right, right. All right so gi- right. give me some of these guys who like kind of stand out from a, from a model perspective, even if they're not like quite there like at the ceiling. Yeah, I mean, uh, one guy who's at least interesting right now is is Braylon Allen, um, who who left high school early, uh, went and played at Wisconsin, and and immediately produced. Immediately, he had he had a, a breakout score in the model that was just elite because he was set, not even eighteen years old. And he's he's playing in the Big Ten and doing work, uh, you know, in in college. Uh, you know, he he doesn't have the the one thing that's that's a little bit difficult with Braylon Allen is uh, he has a lot of size. Like I'm talking, actually, one of his comps in the model right now is Jeremy Hill. He has a lot of size. J- James Conner is his number one comp right now. This is all pre combine, so things can shift. But uh, has a lot of size, but his force missed tackles per attempt was below average, and so you have to wonder. Is he not using his size? And that's what some film scouts have said is that he doesn't play big enough uh, despite that size. So I really, he's one of those guys I really want to see how he does at the combine because if he is like breakaway speed fast, which I don't know if that's going to be the case, but if he is out of nowhere, then all of a sudden you're saying, oh, this is like, you know, not quite Jonathan Taylor. Obviously you're going to make an easy like comp because of the school, but like, you know, you're starting to like get closer to that sort of range of outcome as opposed to, looking at a guy like James Conner, who's solid, but would James Conner be the fantasy asset that he's been, if not for some fortuitous things going on in his own backfields? Probably not, right? Um, so he's he's one to at least keep an eye on. I like Audric Estime, too, out of Notre Dame. Uh, a lot of good size to his profile. Receiving numbers aren't str- super, super strong, and that's something that I always look at uh, with running backs. It's, I'm, I'm, I am a uh, someone who needs receiving production to to really really invest that's why i didn't like totally fall in love with like kenneth walker even though he's amazing on the ground it's just really difficult to like uh to see to foresee those kinds of players being three down backs at the next level we're already kind of seeing it with kenneth walker where it's like not yeah. not quite totally there uh and and audrick estimates is kind of like that too um but I, I do think you know he's a really good breakout scorer in the in the in the model he's looking uh fairly good and then one more that i'll at least shout out is like a like a deeper uh, a, a, a more of a dart throw, which I think this year in like rookie drafts at running back, throwing darts makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of ambiguity to the class. And so why not just go after those guys? But Isaiah Davis out of South Dakota State has uh, just mm. a really, really good, well-rounded profile. I worry that he's not going to have the athleticism and the the burst that we would want. Um, you know, and I want to just see how he tests as well. And then I want to watch him a little bit more over the next like month and a half to just see if that's there or not. But a lot of his marks are there. He looks really, really good in the model. So Isaiah Davis, good size, could be a three down back potentially. Uh, he's one that I'd call out to. Yeah, you got my gears turning on the Braylon Allen like size stuff because I do feel like there's a spectrum with these bigger backs. Where yeah, Jonathan Taylor probably is like kind of the peak of that, and then yeah. James Conner is a good mention. But we would like to avoid like the next AJ Dillon, another yes. guy that's you know six foot and over two hundred thirty pounds. So um, that that's a good kind of spectrum there. Any thoughts just on kind of like more consensus top guys, uh, Jonathan Brooks, Marshawn Lloyd, Trey Benson? I definitely see yeah. a lot of people hyping up uh, Marshawn Lloyd specifically. Yeah, Lloyd doesn't look that great in the model right now just because he got off to a slow start in college. He's an, he's an older back. And so that's the main mm-hmm. reason why I can see why people um you know are, are into him, but 
that's the main reason why I'm probably not investing as heavily today. Right now, I want to see how things just generally go over the next month and a half or so. Jalen Wright is someone who, again, doesn't look amazing because no one looks amazing in, in the model from, from this year's class. But you could see him fitting in today's game, should have a lot of speed, should test well. Um, and uh, you, you could see him playing at least a tandem role. And in today's fantasy game, have, being a 1B or a 1A in, in an offense can still make you an RB2 in fantasy if you're efficient enough. I mean, we saw that with like the smaller backs even this year, with whether it's a Gibbs or a Devon Achan or even a Keaton Mitchell uh, coming out of nowhere. They can still be relevant enough because a lot of those RB2 types are just not seeing as much volume to begin with, um, you know, anymore in, in fantasy. So, and then Jonathan Brooks, I think if he didn't get hurt, he'd probably be the RB1, like consensus RB1 in this class, but he's not the consensus RB1 uh, because of that. And then Trey Benson, I don't, the, the, the model doesn't really love Trey Benson. His best season in, mm. in total yards per team play, not very strong. Breakout score, not very strong. It's just not totally there for Benson analytically. Um, but again, with running back in particular, Draft capital matters more than it does at wide receiver. And it's fine to say this guy's in a pretty good landing spot to maybe increase value from year one to year two. And so I want to see where that kind of shakes out for these guys. Let's finish it up with tight ends here. Um, Cause I know you got the new tight end model coming in the, in the, in the prospect guide. That is uh super exciting. I can't wait to see that. Um, all these people that are going to request me to chart tight ends and I'm never going to do it. Uh, just read JJ's draft guide. So the big question with tight ends here, how good is Brock Bowers? And is this class just Brock Bowers and everybody else? Yeah, I think it probably is Brock Bowers and everyone else. Jatavian Sanders out of, out of uh, Texas um, has pretty good marks. Like he's, like the, the tight end model works a little bit different than the other models do just because tight ends is just a different beast and such. Um, and, and athleticism matters a lot more to it. So, you know, I don't have concrete takes right now because like totally because the combine's still happening this weekend. Uh, but Brock Bowers, I can say as long as he tests reasonably well, or as long as we can assume his numbers are reasonably good, uh, Bowers will be the second best tight end in the model's history, which goes back to 2015 behind Kyle Pitts. And again, People are going to say, oh, Kyle Pitts is the best tight. Yes, he's the best tight end prospect that's come out over that period of time. Like, it's not that crazy to, to say that. Yeah. And Brock Bowers is the number two uh, uh, prospect. So, you know, this this model, the only reason why I got like became confident in it and publishing it this year in the guide. And I'm not doing any profiles of tight ends. I'm just going to publish the results of them after the draft is over and publish the, the scores for these guys. Uh, but the reason I felt confident is because last year it nailed Sam Laporta. It was very, mm. very high on Laporta, was high on that draft class in general, liked both of the Green Bay tight ends. And I think both of them showed out pretty well. Um, yeah. And so I'm like, you know what? Let's just go for it. We're going to we're going to publish the results of this tight end model this year. Uh, but right now, it looks like Brock Bauer is number one. And then I think Jatavian Sanders is the only one that's going to be, you know, more so like sort of in that potential tight end one discussion long term. And then the other guys might not get there. Love it. Well, J.J., you said it all. I feel more uh, ready for this comp for the combine for the draft process. Now that you have caught me up, and like that's what this episode was about. Really, was you? <laughs> yeah, we, we we did some wide receiver talk, whatever. But you were really catching me up on who I need to be charting, uh, who I need to be paying attention to at the other positions. So I appreciate you doing that, buddy. Uh, for the people out there who are somehow not familiar with the late round prospect guide and everything you've got going on, tell them where they can find it. What they need to, I'm telling you, you listen to this podcast, you need to pre order the draft guide. Where can they do it? Thank you. Uh, it's You can find it on lateround.com. Uh, there's a pre order right now. It's only $11.99. Just a couple, as people say, just a couple uh, cups of Starbucks, right? Isn't that what they say? They just, they just, oh, dude, ma ma I got, I got, I got an alert today driving home from, from training said that pr there was a, pr like the price hike in December. It's highest it's been in like, ever in the u.s shoot that might be one cup of coffee by the end Look, of this podcast and i will say that there has been zero inflation with the price of this prospect guide for the three years that this guide has been out so it's the same price it's been <laughs> since the start 11.99 right now you get profiles of every running back and wide receiver that are going to be in the combine if you're if you're nerdy and you want to read what goes into these models i list it out i talk about it for like 20 pages uh, so you can get into that kind of stuff. And then I also have my year two model stuff in there, which is uh, I profile guys 
who uh, the last year's rookie class entering the second year in the NFL. And I talk about how their scores look now after they played a year in the league. So there's profiles. There's like 30 profiles of those guys as well. But you can check it all out over on LateRound.com. Yeah, uh, sneaky. I think that year two stuff is is the most fascinating uh, because and I'm telling you, you know, people out there are that is what they really want to know. I said I said this on the show before. I think last year was the first time from a reception perception standpoint that the website got more you know, business to it on the year two drop than the rookie drop. Yeah. So, yeah, people man, like I mean, it, that's man. people. People want to know about these young players. JJ's uh, work is a great resource for it. Like I said, I reference it all the time. I, I read it. I consume it. It's probably out, outside of my own stuff. Uh, it's some of my favorite because it's just I'm, I don't consume my own work, but like outside of my own study on these players, it's some of the things I think it's something you need to do when you're kind of formulating your opinion on these players. So JJ, appreciate your time, man. Everybody make sure you're also subscribed to the late round fantasy football podcast. I mean, for God's sakes, the late round podcast. Right, just the late round podcast. Baby. Late round fantasy football be, podcast. That's good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You should be subscribed to it if you're not already. If you're listening to this, and you're not listening to that. What are you doing with yourself? All right, we're gonna be back on Tuesday next week with Tara Roberts. We're gonna do some free agency matchmaking, top quarterbacks, the skill position of players. We are gonna match them to a team because that's what this time of year is all about: reckless speculation, no accountability, but a lot of fun. Until then, we're out.